thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction, Liz, and um, thank you to everyone for coming. Can you hear me all right up at the back? Yes, good. Um, I'm sure there's lots of other ways to stay warm on a Wednesday evening, so I'm very grateful that you've chosen to come along and listen to me to, um, in order to get out of the cold. So, as Liz said, I'm going to talk about um, self-management, um, which is something I've been interested in for a long time. My own PhD, about over 10 years ago, uh, incorporated an element of a large element of looking at self-management of people, particularly with chronic low back pain. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about using um, some of my own um, insights from my own research and work that I've done with others um, and from the literature in general, um, some of the policy drivers, etc. Physical activity is a really big part of self-management of most long-term conditions and it's something else that I have a passion for. So I'm going to talk a bit about physical activity as well. And I'm going to relate these two things largely to musculoskeletal long-term conditions and in particular use some, some examples from some research that we've done here um, on low back pain. So I, I guess just to say, I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you here tonight. And I, just to get a bit of a bit of a feel. Can you just raise your hands if you're from RGU, if you're RGU staff or student? Wonderful, thank you very much. If you're NHS, lovely, thank you. If you're none of the above, wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. That's, it's really nice for me to get a feel for, for who's here and I'm delighted that, that you've all come. I think it's almost a third and a, a third and a third. It's a real privilege for me to get the opportunity to do this, to speak to you. Um, I, Liz gave me that lovely introduction and I have a wonderful job. Um, I've been trying to be a clinical academic as, as my colleagues know and Liz knows and Susan knows for a long, long time. And I, I feel that I'm kind of, uh, you know, I can actually call myself a clinical academic. Now I have a foot in the clinical camp. Um, it, don't worry, I'm not treating your patients. I'm there to, to promote research, but I also, um, you know, have the foot in the academic camp as well. So it's a real privilege for me. So I will get on with it. Um, so self-management, what is self-management? That maybe sounds really basic, um, but uh, when I first started working around and having an interest in self-management, um, I, you know, obviously one of the first things you do as a good PhD student is look at the literature and there was really a plethora of literature and a whole heap of studies being done on what is self-management, how do we define it, what's, you know, what's it like for the person that's experiencing it. And actually there's still quite a lot of that going on now. Um, but I quite like this definition. It's really a set of approaches that aims to enable people living with long-term conditions to take control, to manage their own health and put them in the driving seat of their care. Um, and I guess it's, it's thinking about why is it so important um, is, is one of the things I'm going to going to try and think about tonight. Um, we're lucky in Scotland we've had a, um, we've had a strategy, a self-management strategy for quite a long time now. Um, many of you will be familiar with it. I can't say this very well, I don't know if there's any Glaswegians in the audience, but you can say gone yourself an awful lot better than I can. Um, so that, you know, that's been Scotland's self-management strategy for a long time. But there's a lot of, and I've just um, put up a few of the kind of key drivers, all the Allied health professions in the audience will be very familiar with ALIP, um, which is the Active and Independent Living Programme, which is a fairly recent, um, a recent document. And that's in that, that's all about supporting people to manage their well-being, to be active and live independent lives. So self-management is obviously a big um, component of that. Our health and social care delivery plan has a focus on three things, on prevention, um, anticipation and supported self-management. Um, and even our digital health and care strategy is about empowering citizens to better manage their own health and well-being. So, you know, self-management is, 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 is a big um, and important topic. So I, I just thought I'd define uh, long-term conditions as well. Um, and, and again, there's a few definitions around. So conditions for which there's currently no cure and which are managed with drugs and other treatment. Um, some definitions, so this is from the Scottish Government's um, sort of web pages on long-term conditions. They define it as health conditions that last a year or longer, impact on a person's life and may require ongoing care and support. And uh, uh, there's a list of some of the common long-term conditions that I'm sure you'll all know about. So diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, arthritis, chronic pain, high blood pressure, 
um, and mental health conditions, to name but a few. And the work that, that, that I've been involved in to date has really been around um, chronic painful musculoskeletal long-term conditions. Although um, recently um, and increasingly, partly because of the link between them, but also because of the importance of mental health conditions. We have some really, I think, quite exciting research going on around mental health conditions. I'm not going to talk about them tonight for the purpose of time and keeping some focus, but if anyone wants to speak to me about that afterwards, more than happy to. So I just thought I'd give you some statistics. 40% um, of the Scottish population have at least one long-term condition, and they become more prevalent with age. So by 65, two-thirds of us will have at least a long-term condition. And older people are more likely to have more than one long-term condition. Um, so about 27% of 75 to 85-year-olds will have two or more long-term conditions. And of course, with the predictions for our ever-growing ageing population, that has some implications. And it also has implications for management and for provision of self-management support, because and also for research, because what we tend to do, um, particularly I would have to say in research, is we tend to look at one condition and look at self-management of a condition. Um, and I was even questioned in, um, in, a, a, in a, a fairly recent piece of research that we're publishing at the moment by one um, peer reviewer around why did we not exclude people, it was people with low back pain, why did we not exclude people who had other health conditions? Because was the intervention really addressing the back pain or was it addressing the other things as well? I would say it doesn't matter because actually if we can do something that helps people who have multiple conditions, that's, that's even better. Um, but that's going to become increasingly important to look at can we design interventions and how do we help people manage not just one but two or three or, or more long-term conditions. And um, this, uh, we don't ask this question in the Scottish um, uh, GP survey data, but last year's NHS England GP survey data found that one in six people are not confident to manage their long-term condition. So despite everything that we know about self-management of long-term condition, despite all the work that's been done and all the resources that are out there, there's still quite a lot of people that aren't confident to manage them. Right, I've given you lots of statistics be nice if you worked. What do you think this one might relate to in terms of long-term conditions? Anyone like to hazard a guess? Contact with health professionals. Spot on. Absolutely. Yeah. So the average time <coughs> that a person with a long-term condition will spend with their healthcare team is about four hours a year. If they're lucky. <laughs> if they're lucky, this lady at the front said. Does that surprise anyone? I mean, of course, it's an average. So there may be some people with some long-term conditions that, you know, or some years or some times that they see longer. But on average, it's about four hours a year. Um, that, to me, that means two... Re I think there's two really, really important things to take from that statistic. Um, I think the... If we as health... And I still say we. I'm still a health professional, even though I'm not treating your patients currently. Um, as health professionals, what we do in that four hours is so important, isn't it? So the way we behave, the, what we say, how we say it, the way we interact with people, whether we take an approach that truly empowers people to feel able to self-manage their condition um, or whether we don't take that particular approach, really, really important. And the second thing, of course, is that this person who's, when they're not spending that four hours with you, are spending most of their life, of course, managing their long-term condition. Um, so it's really, really important that they have access to support services, um, that they have the knowledge, the skills, etc., to do that. Now, just a, just a, a few kind of um, before I move on, a, a few other things about <laughs> self-management that um, some of these are, are perhaps sometimes overused in the literature, but. Anything that's written about self-management, and this really echoes what um, many people have said to us in research studies across the years when we've done, when we've interviewed them and we've asked them about their experiences and how they feel and what they want from self-management um, support, um, that it should be supported. So it's not about 
away you go and deal with this yourself. It is about how do we support people. And I don't imagine there's anybody in the audience who doesn't, um, who wouldn't agree with that. Being person centred and truly empowering people. And I think that is used, that is talked about a lot um, and is done a lot, but perhaps not always. So there are still some gaps and that's certainly what, what people tell us is that there are still um, some gaps. And then that links with that statistic I showed you from the GP survey in England that not everyone um, feels that they're um, confident to self-manage. And I just always think it's worth putting in this third point that all models and theories of self-management include access to healthcare professionals when needed. So I think sometimes it's easy to think about self-management as just that, managing by yourself. But it's not. It's about some, some um, theories talk about the importance of the relationship between the person with the, the long-term condition and their healthcare team. Um, and mostly it's about having appropriate access when it's needed. And the key tenets of, of um, self-management, which is perhaps unsurprising, is information, education, support and services. Um, and to me, I think the, 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 um, the important things are how we actually do that, how we get these services to, to people and that information to people. And I really like this from, um, this is from the Health Foundation and Nesta, which is a, a, an innovation foundation. Um, and they came up with this, the, you don't need to read it all, but the middle, the EAST acronym they came up with that, that um, said that, you know, for self-management to really be, to really work, it needs to be easy. So we need to take away barriers and even things like um, we might provide the right information <coughs> and say, for example, give somebody a phone number to phone up to get in touch with a service that can help them with self-management or a website or something like that. Um, but it's quite, sometimes quite difficult for the person to make that action, to actually pick up the phone or to take themselves along somewhere. So sometimes there's maybe a step that needs to, to go on in between. So it's making things easy to access, making them attractive. And actually this report even talks about things like if you give people a cup of tea when they come along to your self-management programme, they might be more likely to come along. Um, making it timely, and that's about that there's, there's times in people's either... Um, related to receiving a diagnosis or relating to when they've maybe just had an a, a appointment with a healthcare professional when it's maybe more timely for them to engage in self-management because they're kind of in that in that place um, and also making it social so as I've said before self-management if you've got a long-term condition it's there all the time you're self-managing it all the time so your friends your family your everybody that you interact with um, is going to be affected by it and perhaps they could be involved um, and then there's also the other side of the social about actually making things enjoyable um, so I think these are just some kind of interesting pointers about self-management so I've talked in very general terms I just thought I should say something about the kinds of things that um, that self-management might be um, and as I say it's not just the person with the long-term condition going away into their own home and managing things all by themselves so there's lots of interventions there's um, loads of stuff going on we've got some great stuff going on in Grampian um, and you know Scotland wide and and, um, and and locally as well so things from websites and mobile apps to one-to-one -one support and groups to different types of kind of education programs that are sometimes specific to a, to a particular condition, but sometimes generic because the principles of self-management, a lot of them um, apply to lots of the different long-term conditions and sometimes um, people are managed together. And I'm gonna use just later on in my talk, I'm gonna talk about two particular projects, one that we did on peer support and one that we, we are currently doing on, on the use of a mobile app for self-management of low back pain. Um, and I've deliberately chosen to talk about one digital and one very non-digital. Um, and I'm gonna pick up on the kind of digital theme later on when my, where are you, computing science colleagues might want to shut their ears because I'm not going to suggest that digital is the only way forward, um, but it, it is a good way. But I think that we need to get a bit of a balance. And there we go, right. I'm gonna apologize in advance for putting up what looks like a really messy slide, but it's, actually, it's very easy to understand um, once I hopefully explain it. So this is from a really interesting study. Um, if the health professionals or my academic colleagues in health haven't 
come across it yet, go and look it up. Um, there's a wonderful website. It's the Global Burden of Disease Study. This has been going on for a long time. Um, some fantastic people across the globe involved in it. And it's basically a massive epidemiological study looking at um, you know, what conditions are affecting the, the population. And then they give us some really nice statistics and break it up into we can look by um, regions, so Europe, the world, etc. What this is showing, and it's just to make the point about why should I be talking about back pain really, um, when there are lots of other conditions, and there are lots of other conditions. So if this was about mortality, so the things that are killing people worldwide are still heart disease, cancer, um, and actually chronic lung diseases are, are up there in the top three as well now. But what this is, is years lived with disability. Um, so partly this is a function of we are living longer, but we're developing um, more of these long-term conditions that have a disabling effect and, a, and, a, and an impact on, um, on people's lifestyle. So this graph is showing basically, and a year lived with disability is, means that somebody is living in a less than ideal um, health situation. And the size of the box, or the size of the shape, shows how much that particular contribution contributes to worldwide years with disability and back pain is number one. It was actually number one in, um, in the last uh, survey which was 1990 and this is 2017 data. So as bang up to date as you can get and back pain is number one. So you'll see the top four causes are low back pain, headache disorders, depressive disorders and diabetes. Um, and in musculoskeletal conditions in general, they're, they're big causes of disability, of people living with disability. So as well as back pain, you can see neck pain is quite big, other musculoskeletal, which includes things like the consequences of fractures. Um, and then the small thin boxes underneath are actually osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so I find this stuff really interesting. I hope you do. But, but it just makes the point that, you know, musculoskeletal conditions are... Um, they, they are sometimes they're maybe not seen as quite so high profile, so serious, um, but they're causing a lot of people a lot of disability. So I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about low back pain as a particular musculoskeletal condition that um, as a as a I suppose a fairly new physiotherapist, I quite quickly developed an interest in low back pain. I um, I qualified as a physio at a time when I'm giving away my age here if there's anybody in the audience who remembers this, but GP fund holding had just come in. So an outpatient department opened up in the hospital I was working in and nobody really wanted to do outpatients apart from some of the people, some of us kind of um, new grads who thought it would be quite exciting. So um, I find myself going into outpatients quite early, treating all these musculoskeletal conditions. Um, I then, a wee bit later, and, and really enjoyed um, um, treating the musculoskeletal conditions. Then a wee bit later, when I was working in some outpatient clinics, um, I noticed among my colleagues a bit of a, oh, it's a chronic back pain patient. Oh gosh, we can't do an awful lot for them. And it was almost this kind of, um, I think just, just a little bit of, not that I don't want to see them, but more that I don't know what I can do for them. And that actually made me, and I suppose that's why I ended up going into academia, made me think, well, what can we do for them and should we be doing for them? And that was at a time when there was a lot of really good research going on um, and some of the kind of new approaches to being much more active and, and getting people with back pain moving came in. So back pain is a, a, a real interest of mine. Um, and it's, it's important to say that back pain is not a disease, it is a symptom. Um, and one of the difficult things about back pain is most back pain is non-specific. And by that, I mean that most people with back pain, we don't actually know exactly what's causing their back pain. And that's really difficult if you're a patient. Um, and there's lots of research going on and gone on, and I'm sure still will go on as to, so that we can answer that question when somebody comes into clinics and says, what is causing my back pain? Of course, there are lots of structures in the back that cause pain, that have nerve endings, um, and it, you know, you know um, it, physiotherapists can, can work out and deduce what probably is causing the pain, um, but most people do get a diagnosis of non-specific back pain. So a very small percentage of people, less than 1%, have back pain that's from something that really needs urgent medical or surgical attention. There's another about 5 to 10% that have back pain um, that's 
of nerve root origin and that needs a slightly different management but that leaves us with about um, 90 to 95 percent of people where we say it's non-specific um, and the, it's really really common so because oh sorry I didn't want to do that actually because I'm talking about back pain and because I'm talking going to talk about physical activity in a moment and if you've ever been to one of my talks before, you know you don't get to sit down for the whole thing. So if you don't want to stand up, you can raise your hand instead. But I'd like to invite you to stand up. It's really good for your back. It's taking a bit of pressure off your spine and it's allowing you to be less sedentary. What I'd like you to do is um, stay standing up if you have never had low back pain. Now, my definition of low back pain before anyone sits down is pain either in the back might go down into your buttocks might go down one leg lasting at least 24 hours and interfering with your life in a you know in some way if you've never had back pain never ever sit down if you have not had back pain stay standing if you have had back pain i confused you Okay, I apologize for confusing you. So you are all people who have had back pain at least once in your life, yes. Please don't sit down yet. Um, it's not very good for you. I'm trying to make you less sedentary. Um, that's, that's, you're probably about right. We reckon, we usually say about 90% of people will have back pain at some point in their lives. I want you to now think about the last month and sit down if you have not had back pain in the last month. So stay standing if you've had back pain within the last month. Okay, and now you may all sit down. I thank you for, jo for joining in with my very <laughs> vague epidemiological experiment, but what that shows is actually, you're quite, uh, for a non-representative cross-section of society, you're quite representative. About 30% of people in any one month period will have back pain. Um, and the purpose of that is really just to show, yes, it is really common. I'm sure you know, those of you who said you've never had back pain, you know somebody who's had back pain or has back pain now. Um, and back pain has a kind of variable course. We used to talk about things like, we used to say 90% of acute back pain will get better within six weeks. And if it doesn't, it's likely to have quite a poor prognosis and um, quite likely to go on and, and, and have disability. That's actually starting to be kind of rethought um, now. We probably in the past overestimated the number of people whose back pain would completely go within the six weeks and slightly, um, sorry, underestimated and slightly overestimated how many people would go on and have, um, have a, a dis disability. But what we do know is that recurrence is really common. Another thing that used to be thought was that each episode of back pain was new and was different. So you might have back pain once, not have it for years, have it again. We now very much think that actually it probably is a condition that you have and then it maybe settles and then it recurs, but it's all related. Um, and again, for my clinical colleagues in the audience, um, if you haven't seen the fantastic series on low back pain in last year's Lancet um, about some of the kind of current concepts around epidemiology and management of back pain, really, really worth a read. Um, but what we do know is recurrence is common and some people do develop long lasting back pain. Now that might be the type that comes and goes. So not everybody with um, long term back pain has it all the time, but some people do. Um, and we've certainly had people in some of our studies who've had back pain for 20 years and it never goes away. They're never without their back pain. So why is that? Well, this is kind of oversimplifying things, but, and again, this, this is from this lovely series in, in The Lancet. Um, I've, I've kind of um, pinched there some of their, the way of demonstrating this, but there's all these different factors that have complex sort of interplays with each other that all um, go on to, to, to determine how somebody experiences their pain and also how much disability they may have from back pain as well. So why am I telling you this? Well, what we do with people with back pain and, and any, any physiotherapists um, or, or, or um, most health professionals in the audience and in fact anybody who's had back pain will know this, 
in the acute phase if somebody suddenly develops back pain generally it probably doesn't need much treatment because it should going from these statistics i've just shown you get better within about six weeks so we educate people we provide reassurance we tell them it's likely to get better what we do know from the evidence is that being physically active is good um, yes, um, taking, taking pain relief, usually simple pain relief, um, and non-pharmacological therapies, so non-drug therapies, and exercise is the one that we have the most evidence for. And it's important to review these people because just to make sure that they are on track and are going to, um, going to get better. For long-term back pain, the best evidence we have is around self-management, exercise, and encouraging physical activity. Um, it also, people are generally advised to stay at work if they can, because we know that staying at work is much better for us in lots of ways than, than not staying at work. So, I mean, this, I'm sure this is not news um, to, to, to anybody in the audience now, and, and you know, the days of people going on bed rest for back pain are, are long behind us. So I'm gonna slightly change tack for a moment and then bring the two things together um, and talk about physical activity. So I've just said that physical activity and exercise is really the mainstay of um, treatment and self-management advice for people with, with long-term low back pain. So we all know this. We should be doing 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity and also muscle strengthening exercises two days a week. Um, that's what all the guidelines tell us. Um, it prevents and helps to manage many health conditions. It's great for our well-being, our mood, helps us relax, relieve stress, gives us a sense of achievement. Um, it has been said that if physical activity was a drug, it would be a wonder drug. It would be a miracle cure um, because there are so many things that it can actually help with. But it's really, really difficult. And again, be honest, I won't make you stand up this time because you've, you've, already, you've already had your change of posture. Um, but be really honest, in the past week, have you achieved the physical activity guidelines, which would be 150 minutes of moderate intensity? That's the important bit. So if it's walking, it's that um, being, getting not totally out of breath, but raising your heart rate a little, raising your temperature a little, raising your breathing rate a little. Um, 150 minutes equates to, you know, obviously kind of half an hour on about five days a week, plus two lots of muscle strengthening exercise. Who has managed to do that in the past week? Yeah, pretty good audience, actually, yeah. But it's difficult, isn't it? It is actually quite difficult to do that. And we know that 39% of adults in the UK don't meet the physical activity recommendations. Now, if you throw into that a long-term condition that makes you depressed, demotivated, um, painful, then it's, it's not surprising that actually it's really hard to do. When we say that being physically active and doing exercises is one of the best ways to manage your long-term condition. It's actually really hard. And that's why people do need support with it. So just as, a, as an add-on to that, we've got another um, kind of, um, another baddie is the sedentary behavior. Um, and I made a bit of a joke about making you stand up and interrupting your sedentary time. But we now also know that independent, so you might have had your 30 minutes today of moderate intensity physical activity. But if you then sit down um, for, for a long, long period of time, then you're almost undoing the benefit that you've had from your physical activity because we now know that sedentary behaviour is independent of whether you're active or not is a risk factor for many long-term conditions. So, like um, heart disease, cancer and diabetes. And they, they reckon that six to eight hours is the threshold at which if we sit for, you know, recurrently sit for longer than six to eight hours a day, our risk shoots up of these chronic conditions. Um, so it's important not just to, to tell people about physical activity and exercise, but actually reducing our sitting or our sedentary time as well. So this links me on to the first study. I'm going to talk about three um, studies. I'm just checking my time. I'm going to talk about three studies um, to use as examples of um, some of the things that we've looked at um, and explored and some of the things that we've done that relate to this, um, to this topic. Um, so I did, along with a colleague, Lindsay Alexander, who can't be here tonight, um, we did a systematic review looking at what are the barriers and the facilitators to physical activity. Because as I've just shown and you've shown as an audience, it's hard for all of us to achieve our um, 
physical activity recommendations. Um, I, I just might flip back actually and say, how many of you try aim to get 10,000 steps a day? Yeah, okay. Um, it's maybe just, it's maybe just worth them, um, just, um, I, I think, find this fascinating and, and I suppose that's why I just want to throw it in that a lot of us have got very into the kind of the idea that we must achieve 10,000 steps a day and in fact one of our research projects that I am going to talk about in a moment, we are encouraging people to increase their step count. But if you look at the evidence, it's not actually really good for 10,000 steps. Most of you will achieve your physical activity target. So that 30 minutes of moderate intensity, you'll probably achieve that in about 5,000 steps for, for most average people. So is it actually helpful to get people to, to particularly people with long-term conditions, to go for more and more and more exercise and aim for 10,000 steps? Personally, as a health professional, I would much rather somebody was doing 30 minutes, which is maybe about 5,000 steps um, of really good moderate intensity exercise than sauntering along and not at a very low intensity, but managing to do 10,000 steps. Um, the reason it can still be useful is that um, some studies have shown that people who are told to try and do 10,000 steps, if they aim for that, they're thinking more about physical activity and they're more likely to do 30 minutes of moderate intensity. But there are also some really recent studies that have looked at um, comparing 30 minutes of moderate to groups of people who were given pedometers and told to do 10,000 steps a day. And the ones who actually were told about the benefits and, and told to do moderate intensity <laughs> exercise did better. Um, so that's a slight side issue, but it's a bit of a, it was a, bit of a um, interest of mine. So what we found in this big review, we, we looked at all the literature from the past 10 years on barriers and facilitators to, to being physically active, um, which was well in excess of 60 studies. And we found that they could all come into kind of four categories and they're probably not surprising. You'll all, the, the, the purple ones are the barriers and you'll pr probably all have experienced some of the barriers. So the ones that are personal to you, like being tired and lack of motivation or pain, the ones that are to do with your relationship with others, like um, commitment to, to families, um, the environmental ones we all know about, the kind of living in Aberdeen can often be an environmental barrier to going outside and being physically active. Um, and interestingly, social cultural in some, um, not just cultures um, and settings, but some families, um, units, it's actually maybe not seen as a good thing it's not a priority to um, be setting aside time for yourself to, to be physically active um, but the flip side to that was all of these categories that had barriers also had facilitators and th these were studies where um, researchers had either interviewed people about um, what encouraged them or helped them to be more physically active or, or where they'd, they'd surveyed large groups of people so People get motivated to exercise because it can improve their health if they see that their weight's reducing or that they're looking better as well. Um, if they get support from people, much more likely to exercise and, and be physically active. Um, and if some of the barriers, the environmental barriers, like if the environment's made a bit safer and, and a bit more accessible. Um, and of course, a lot of people do physical activity actually not because of the health benefits or the physical activity benefits, but because it's social. Um, so things like, you know, dancing or going out with, um, you know, going out for walks with family or, 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 or that type of thing. So I guess the reason that, um, that I think this is of interest is that we need to be considering these um, barriers, but more importantly, considering what the facilitators are and trying to tap into that when we're trying to um, encourage and support people to be more physically active because I think it's something and I don't believe that anybody um, you know advises or gives people information about physical activity and exercise in any kind of sort of flippant way but I think it is quite easy for us sometimes to forget actually how hard it is to do um, and I think it's worth reflecting on that. So the second project I'm going to talk about is um, one that we um, we completed this um, a, a year or so ago now, and it was around peer support um, for low back pain self-management. But since this project, we've I've, um, maintained an interest in peer support. We had some students do a nice project last year, really looking at um, the peer support services that were available across the Grampian area. Um, and it's something that we, we plan to pursue. This came from a 
service user. So all of the research that, certainly all the research I do, um, all the research we do in the School of Health Sciences here, we try to make it um, as relevant to people, service users and practice as possible. Um, so this actually came from a, um, a, a patient and public involvement group. So we, we ran a little PPI group and, and I, I always get questioned when I talk about PPI. It's something I have a real passion for as well as patient public involvement. It's not me phoning you up and saying, do you want me to save you some money because of your missold insurance? Um, so just like to clear that up. So we had a, we had a group and, and um, it was, we were exploring and um, we had some ideas, myself and some colleagues from at the time Aberdeen University had some ideas around um, what we might do for self-management for people with low back pain. And this is really thinking about people who maybe had physiotherapy or had GP management. And then it's like maybe a stepping stone afterwards before we say, right, you're really expected to do this kind of by yourself. Um, and what they said to us was that um, there are groups available and this was a this was local people so they said there are groups available and we know that there are groups and we could go to them and that's fine for some people if they like groups and um, we know that there are websites we could look at and that's fine for the people that like websites and you know several other things but what they felt was sometimes it's just nice to speak to somebody else who really understands what you're going through um, and of course the person who's self-managing or living with a long-term condition is the expert in living with a long-term condition. Um, so we had this, we kind of developed this idea around peer support, and then we did another um, literature review project. So we thought we better check that nobody's done this. Nobody had. There was some really good, and is some really good evidence for the benefit of peer support, which is basically just somebody getting support from somebody else who's considered an equal to them. Usually in health, that means somebody who's got the same health condition, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and for example, in our study, it was low back pain. Um, and most of the people who, who we trained as peer support volunteers did have low back pain, but there were a couple of them who didn't have back pain themselves, but they had supported a family member for a long time who had back pain and had a lot of insight. So that actually worked really well. Um, so in the review, we found that there was really good evidence for use of peer support in other conditions, but not in back pain. Um, and since then, there's still, there, there's some other evidence in, in, in musculoskeletal conditions. There's been some work done in the States around um, using peer support for veterans with, with chronic musculoskeletal conditions. And in the Nordic countries, they've used peer support quite successfully in the workplace to support people coping with low back pain when they return to work, which is a really nice model. So we looked at the literature, we also consulted widely. We were very lucky at this stage, the Mental Health Foundation had just done a really big project around peer support for people with mental health conditions and they developed a training programme. Um, so we had a lot of support from them and we did consultation with a lot of um, third sector organisations that were either running peer support services or incorporated peer support. So for example, um, a lot of cardiac rehabilitation groups have an element of peer support to them where they, they kind of match people up to support each other. And then we went out and we did some interviews with some physiotherapists, some older adults with low back pain who would potentially be the people that we might be aiming this intervention at, um, and some people who would potentially um, be, be the types of people who might volunteer to train as peer support volunteers. And we just wanted to explore with them, like, what do you think? Do you think it's a daft idea or do you think it's something that might, um, might be worth doing? And on the back of that, we then developed this intervention and we developed a training programme for our peer support volunteers. And then we conducted a study really looking at, because it hadn't been done before, can we do it? Can we train people? Will, they, will people actually volunteer to do this? Um, will they want to do this? Um, and um, you know, is it successful? Can we train them? Can we then match them up with people? And does it seem to work? Um, and luckily, it, it had some nice outcomes. So, we called it PALS, um, which was our peer support in Aberdeenshire for long-term condition self-management. And this was one of our, um, some participants from one, from one of our training programs. So we based it on the theory of empowerment, which is really about, about empowering people to, to be able to self-manage a, self a health condition. Um, it was based on self-efficacy. It was about trying to increase people's self-efficacy and self-efficacy is really self-confidence. So we were trying to make people more confident um, to manage their condition. And goes back to that statistic I used earlier that one in six people are still not confident to self-manage their, their, their long-term condition. And that's what we were trying to do, was trying to make people more confident. It was based on 
evidence-based guidelines for managing low back pain, so physical activity, exercises, and other self-management strategies, which are things like, um, we advise people with low back pain to do things like maybe relaxation, to try pacing their activities, um, and, and various different other things like you know, advice around pain relief, etc. We devised a two-day training programme, which was very much modelled on the, um, the peer support programme that had been developed by the Mental Health Foundation. And in fact, one of their um, project workers helped us to deliver the first um, running of our training to our peer support volunteers. And then the intervention itself was six sessions where somebody with low back pain and somebody who we trained as their peer support volunteer met. They met in a community location, so to get do away with, we weren't having people going into each other's homes. If they couldn't meet up, sometimes they phoned instead. Um, and it took place over about a 12-week period. So they met a, a, approximately once every two weeks. Um, and the aim was that they had, a, they had a manual and they had a guide as to the sort of topics that they were supposed to cover in each of the sessions, but it was flexible to, um, to the needs of the individual. And this is the study that we had people not just with low back pain. We made a conscious decision. A lot of back pain research does say, okay, to be eligible for my study, you have to have low back pain and nothing else because all the other things might um, interfere with the results of the study. But we actually said, do you know what? We want real people. So if you've got back pain, you can come into our study. There were, there were a few um, contraindications, a few things that people, we, we wouldn't, for sort of safety reasons and all the rest of it, we wouldn't have in our study. Um, but we had people who had back pain and other chronic conditions as well. Um, and what we found was the training the training was great fun to deliver, so that, that, so that was kind of nice for the research team. Um, but we tested people's knowledge of back pain self-management principles before and after, so we were able to increase their knowledge to increase the peer support volunteers' confidence that they could do the role. Um, and it was, it was positively evaluated by everyone um, who took part. Um, and nobody failed it. Um, and we did, the, the, some of the previous literature on self-management um, interventions we, we took a steer from them and we did because it is important that we have the right people going out and, and supporting people with low back pain so it was a, a kind of condition of going on and, and taking part in the second phase of the study that they would pass the kind of knowledge test around uh, low back pain self-management so the intervention worked in so much as people, we were inundated with people who wanted to train as peer support volunteers. We managed to train and retain um, our peer support volunteers. Um, we managed to provide the intervention and it appeared to benefit both the older people and also the peer support volunteers. And there's lots of evidence of this in the literature that people who actually um, volunteer to be the peer support volunteers get a lot of benefit out of doing it. We need to make some minor changes, which we've done um, to this. And, and, and what we really want to do next is a big evaluation study to look at this, its clinical effectiveness and its cost effectiveness. And even, I'm going to go on and talk very quickly about a, a digital health study for low back pain. But even in this digital age, I still think there is a place for these types of interventions. Um, Self-management is really about providing the right resources and the right support in the right format at the right time for the right person. And there are very definitely people who want eyeball to eyeball or face to face um, contact. So peer support is something that we're still pursuing. So the last thing I'm really gonna talk about is, our, uh, is a digital health um, intervention, a smart digital um, decision support system for self-management of low back pain. So this is a big EU study. Um, and my colleague, Nermali, who's hiding somewhere, <laughs> over there is our RDU lead. Um, so this is a lovely project. It's a, it's a collaboration between computing science and health um, across um, four countries um, led by the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, and this has been a real pleasure to, work, to have worked on for the past three years. Um, Normally, and her colleagues, largely Sadiq and Stuart, have taught me everything I know about computing science. Um, and in return, I've taught you about medical ethics, so I'm not entirely sure that, that that's a, a good deal for you. Um, so very briefly, um, because um, if you came to Normally's talk last year, her professor, professorial lecture was all about all the clever computing stuff that self backs doing. I'm not going to attempt to explain that, but I'm going to talk about some of the self-management and some of the behaviour change techniques that we've been using and developing. 
So the idea of self-back very quickly is that a patient will log onto a computer screen and they'll fill in some information about themselves, about their symptom severity and their function and all the rest of it. That will then go into a big um, computer system, and this is ba a kind of case-based reasoning system for those that, that understand the, the jargon. Um, and that will have lots and lots and lots of patients in it, lots and lots of cases, information about patients, symptoms, their sort of demographic details, and importantly, the self-management plans that they were given and whether they benefited them or not. So that patient's details goes into this big engine, and then it says, ah, we had somebody who was similar to you, we gave them this type of self-management plan, and they got better. So that would be the best plan to start with for you. And they get an automatically generated self-management plan that they then interact with on a mobile phone, um, on an app. Um, and it's based on three things. It's based on physical activity. So we are getting people to track their, their daily steps. Um, we're not necessarily getting them to aim for 10,000 steps, but we are getting them to aim for gradually increasing their steps and for doing them at moderate intensity. So that, um, that moderate intensity that I talked about earlier. So physical activity, they also get specific exercises. So there's a, a, a large bank of exercises. And then the, 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 the um, self-management plan that the case-based reasoning system chooses for that person, it'll then give them um, maybe a selection of maybe three to five exercises. But the person can then tailor it. They can look at their plan and say, oh, I did that exercise last week, but didn't like it. It made me a bit sore. Can you give me a different one? And then it'll look for an exercise that does the same thing. So it might be a flexibility exercise, um, but in a different way. And it'll give them a, a suggestion so they can personalize it a wee bit more. Um, and then the third component of self pack is education. So all that really um, important um, education about staying active, about what to, to do when your pain flares up, um, about the importance of um, relaxation and different things as well. So they're given an education component each week as well. Um, and what we're trying to do with self back and why I think it's so exciting is that um, Apps are, apps are big business, apps are undoubtedly here to stay, um, and digital health interventions have, have a huge um, you know, potential positive benefit. But actually, there's really little evidence, particularly in the field of low back pain, that they have clinical benefit. Um, and that's been in both, both a, a review of the literature that was done for the self-back study and in, uh, and in a couple of other recent reviews. Um, it's shown that there's really not much evidence of clinical benefit of many self-management apps. And just out of interest, I went onto the app store on my mobile phone yesterday and typed in back pain, and there's a huge amount of things that come up. Um, so that's a bit of a worry. And um, there's also been a lot of research done that says actually apps, they need to be accurate. Um, we need to be, be giving people the right information, evidence-based information, but also they need to be engaging. Um, so there are elements in the self-back app that are, um, that are aimed to try and make it more engaging. And we also did another systematic review um, uh, looking particularly at what barriers and facilitators there were for people engaging in digital interventions for low back pain. And this has given us lots of information on, on how, to, um, how to help develop the self-back app. So it's based on um, behavior change theory. One of the other criticisms of apps and actually quite a lot of digital health interventions is that they're not um, theory-based. Um, and that it's therefore difficult for anybody else to replicate them. So one study might show a benefit, but then it's quite difficult for people to replicate. Um, so we've, using the, the COMB model is something that's um, widely utilized in, in behavior change. And really, in simple terms, what that's saying is we have to change one of these three things down the side to change somebody's behavior. So we have to change either their capability, their motivation or the opportunity they have for doing that particular behavior, in this case, physical activity. So RGU's um, uh, main contribution to, self, to this um, European Union funded self uh, project, self back project, is around the physical activity component. So my colleagues in computing have been doing really clever stuff with um, algorithms, etc., and working out how to detect um, physical activity um, and how to get all the um, all of the bits and pieces working in the app. And then what we've done together is we've looked at how we can apply behavior change theory um, and make it um, actually based on theory and give people appropriate um, 
motivational messages to, to help them be more physically active. Um, so we've applied something called the behaviour change technique taxonomy, which um, many of the, the academics may have heard of. And that's really that's to mean that it's reported better. And again, another criticism of behaviour change interventions is often it's really difficult to unpick what people have done. So even if a study is really good, and it shows that people benefit from a behaviour change intervention, whether it's digital or not. If a clinician can't actually work out what exactly they've done, it's going to be really, really difficult to try and put it into practice. So we've labelled all the behaviour change techniques that we've used in self -back, we've labelled them according to this um, taxonomy, um, so that it'll be really transparent, and if other people want to try and replicate it in the future, they can do. Um, so some of the behaviour change things that we've done are um, very simple. So if somebody sets a goal, um, they're, they're, um, they may or they may not achieve it. But if somebody sets a goal, but they actually have to press a button to confirm, this is my goal, I am going to do this, um, they're more likely to achieve it. If they also tell somebody that they're going to, this is my goal. Um, so if I say to somebody, I, I am going to do my 30 minutes of physical activity five days a, a week this week, if I tell somebody else, I'm much more likely to do it. So they're telling the app and they're having to in interact with the app. So they're setting a goal. Um, they have a weekly review and they get, and also continually on the app, they get, um, just like all your physical activity monitors, you get feedback on how you're doing um, in, in meeting your goal. Um, and we've developed a range of notifications that are related to their achievement of their, or not, of their, of their steps. Um, and that's been really interesting because um, we thought in our naivety, oh, there's loads of work being done in this, we'll just go and look at the previous literature and see what already exists. Um, but very, very little has actually been published on. People have said that they've, just, they've had apps and they've had mm, sort of motivational messages, but very few actually say which ones they've used. Um, so we again did a lot of user involvement work and got people to say to us, you know, what are the messages that annoy you? What are the messages that you think might motivate you? Um, and we've incorporated some of the ones that people said they thought would motivate them. Um, and it's really difficult sometimes to get the tone right because if somebody has achieved 10% of their daily target, you do want to, to give them a message that tells them they actually need to do a wee bit more, but you don't want to demotivate them. Um, and I think this is, this is a really interesting area of research. I'm not entirely convinced that anyone's got it right yet. Um, and this is where I think in the future, um, and we've had some really interesting discussions with our computing colleagues about this, really personalising digital interventions. Um, because what is an annoying message to me might actually be a really, really motivational message to you. So there's no such thing as one size fits all. And I think if anybody can crack that, then um, some of these digital health apps will be really, really effective, much more effective than they are even now. Um, another thing that we do is if people haven't met their physical activity um, goal, we ask them if there's any if there are reasons. We, we, we give them an option of some of the common barriers, and if they identify these barriers, we give them a message that's related specifically to that barrier. So it's trying to tailor it a little bit, a little bit more than just the standard message that maybe everybody might get from a physical activity monitor. Um, and also, if, they, if we see... Um, or if the system sees that they've had an increase in their pain that week or that they've decreased their function or that their well-being is not so great, they'll get a particular type of message. So this is, I think, really interesting work. It's really groundbreaking work, trying to kind of personalise things a little bit more um, for people. And, um, you know, I've said before, self-management is about doing the right thing at the right time and all the rest of it. And this is just an example in, with, with digital health um, where I think we, we need to go much more about, and there's probably much more that can be done about truly personalising um, self-management information to people. Oh, why am I not working? There we go. Um, so, so today, just to, to kind of update where we're at with self at RGU we conducted a feasibility study um, looking at just this component, got some nice feedback from people who used the app for four weeks on what they thought was good about it and what they thought maybe needed to, to be developed. Um, what was quite interesting was when, when we interviewed people after they'd used it for a period of time, um, 
One of the barriers that was suggested um, wasn't suggested by people who were older in age, tended to be suggested by people who were younger in age, that actually older people might not want to engage with an app um, and, and if they had older smart, they're, they're more likely to have older smartphones and they might not work. Um, but we did have some older people in the study and who loved the app, so I'm not entirely, entirely convinced that that's, that's the case, but it's something that's going to be quite interesting going forward. Um, the things that they said were facilitators were getting notifications, getting daily reports, um, but the biggest thing they said to us was that if an app like this was recommended by their healthcare professional, they would be much more likely to use it. Um, and I think that's where we do need to get very joined up um, in terms of developing apps. I've been to many a conference where people have pre presented lovely apps that they've developed, but they won't be recommended by healthcare professionals or they can't be adopted by NHS app stores, etc. So um, that's something that um, I think is a real pity um, if people are putting a lot of effort into developing apps. So something we're really keen on is to, all, to, to always work with clinical colleagues and work with NHS partners around um, what's going to be, going to be useful. Um, and again, they said to us that the personalisation was highly valued, so we need to be personalising all our interventions. I'm just going to finish very briefly on um, what I think are some challenges. I think, and this is not just digital, I think in general there's kind of there's a potential for information overload. There is actually loads of information out there on, on self-management. Um, you just need to Google it and loads and loads of stuff comes up. But sometimes I think it's quite hard and people probably do need a pointer from somebody suitably qualified and influential as to actually where should I be going for advice, information, support, etc. I think personalisation is a really big um, key factor. Again, not just in digital health interventions. I think it is about this doing the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right person. Um, and I think we're a lot, we're a lot further on with that than we used to be. But um, it's it's sometimes difficult when. It would be much easier if we had services that were, um, you know, one service that fitted everybody, where actually we, I suppose, need to be thinking about what do I do for this individual rather than, than, than what does my intervention need to look like. Um, I put a question mark beside digital by default. I think that's the way we're going, and actually that's the phrase that's used in, in a recent um, in Scottish Government um, document. I'm not entirely sure what I think about that, if I'm honest, um, in terms of self-management, because I think it has great potential. We're doing some amazing work, um, computing and health related work. Um, there's a bit of a question mark around whether digital technology can, for example, um, help with loneliness and social isolation, or might it cause more loneliness and social isolation if by doing everything digitally, we're keeping people in their homes. Um, is there is a conversation by Skype or a consultation with a health healthcare professional over a webcam just as good as eyeballing them face to face or getting some therapeutic touch? Um, I, I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's an interesting question that we have to look at. We are no doubt going digital and I'm a great supporter of digital interventions, but I think that we have to look at the balance and look at having options for maybe the people who don't na won't naturally just um, inter just interact with digital interventions. So the future, I hope, is truly person-centred interventions, really, really personalised interventions um, that I think we're we're starting to to do um, in self back. But I can see having been involved in that work, I think we can all see everyone who's involved in that project, the potential for making things even more personalised with even better, perhaps automated feedback using sensors, etc, and tracking people. Um, I think co-production, I haven't I had time to talk about that this evening, but um, I, I, you know, I think we must be um, co-producing things, not just consulting with people about what they want, but actually producing um, interventions with people. And that's certainly what we aim to do when, when we're doing any research on, on, on self-management interventions. And for me, um, implementation and scaling things up is, is really, really important um, because there is, there's a lot of going on in the research community around self-management, um, but we know, and I think I talk about this every time I do a talk about that knowledge practice gap, that research still takes too long to get into practice. So I, I hope, and that's why I, you know, I'm in such a, um, 
I think, fantastically privileged position to have a role that actually spans academia and the health service um, that, that maybe I'm not saying I can solve the problem about implementation, but maybe we can, we can start to, to speed some of these things up. So whose role is it? Well, it's everybody's role, isn't it? It's not, I, I think really my take home message is it's not just the person with self-management's role, it's all of our roles. If you um, live with or are friends with or know somebody with a long-term condition, it's your role to support them. Um, if you're a healthcare professional, it's your role to make sure that what you do in that small amount of time that you spend with that person in relation to the rest of their year, that you do the right thing in the right way. Um, and it's our role as researchers, I think, to do the right research that's going to be meaningful and give useful interventions to people.